Laudato Jesus Christus, Vatican and World News. In the headlines this Wednesday, March 17th, Pope Francis appeals for an end to violence in Myanmar and Paraguay. Christians in Syria reflect on 10 years of bloody civil war. And St. Patrick's Day is marked by virtual celebrations in Ireland, Nigeria and all around the world. In the Vatican, I am Francesca Merlo. Pope Francis today launched yet another heartfelt appeal for an end to violence in Myanmar as security forces continue their bloody crackdown against anti-coup demonstrators. Speaking at the end of his general audience, the Pope said he was kneeling on the streets of Myanmar pleading for an end to the violence. Robin Gomes has more on the story. Ancora una volta e con tanta tristezza sento l'urgenza di evocare la drammatica situazione in Myanmar. Once again and with great sadness I feel the urgency to evoke the dramatic situation in Myanmar where so many people especially young people are losing their lives to offer hope to their country Pope Francis said at the end of his weekly general audience on Wednesday. Anche io mi inginocchio sulle strade del Myanmar. Speaking in Italian, the Holy Father said, I too kneel on the streets of Myanmar and say, stop the violence. I too extend my arms and say, let dialogue prevail. The Holy Father was obviously evoking the powerful gesture of Myanmar Catholic nun Sister Anne Rosa Nu Thuang, who drew media headlines when she faced up to the security forces urging them not to harm the peaceful protesters. The incident took place on February the 28th in Mitkina, the capital of Kachin state, as the police readied themselves to crack down on the street protesters. Undeterred by the tense and dangerous situation, the 45-year-old Zaverian nun approached the police and kneeling down before them, she pleaded with folded hands not to harm the demonstrators. She was ordered to leave immediately, but she stood her ground saying, just shoot me if you want to. The protesters have no weapons and they are just showing their desire peacefully. Myanmar has been in turmoil since the February 1st military coup that ousted the elected government and detained its leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Protests and a civil disobedience campaign of strikes against the coup have been going on despite a heavy crackdown by security forces. More than 180 protesters have been killed, according to the latest tally by the Assistance Association for Political Prisoners Activist Group. I am Robin Gomes. Today, Pope Francis also appealed for dialogue to prevail over violence in Paraguay. Speaking at the conclusion of his general audience, he expressed his worry over the tense situation in the South American nation due to a deepening health and political crisis. Thaddeus Jones tells us more. Pope Francis on Wednesday prayed for peace and dialogue in Paraguay, where protests over the difficult economic, political and health conditions have led to instances of violence in recent days. Me han preocupado las noticias que llegan del Paraguay. The Pope expressed his concern over the situation and prayed that through the intercession of Our Lady of Miracles of Caacupe, a Marian shrine in Paraguay he visited in July 2015, I ask the Lord Jesus, Prince of Peace, that a path of sincere dialogue may be found to find adequate solutions to the current difficulties. Sincere dialogue, he said, is needed to overcome the violent unrest, which is always self-destructive and where nothing is gained through it. But much is lost, sometimes everything, he noted. Dialogue and solidarity can help build together the longed-for peace, he underscored. Church leaders in Paraguay have also been appealing for calm and called for a national dialogue in the face of the current crisis worsened by the rising COVID infections and economic stress caused by the pandemic. I'm Thaddeus Jones. Highlighting the sad anniversary of 10 years of war in Syria, Archbishop Joseph Toby of Aleppo of the Maronites reflects on the war in Syria and its effects on both church and country in an interview with Vatican News. Father Benedict Mayaki tells us more. After a decade of violence and conflict, the civil war in Syria has exacted a heavy toll on its population. Millions have been killed, hundreds of thousands have been injured or are displaced, and an untold number are in need of humanitarian assistance. Particularly affected in this terrible situation are the children. The United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, 
reports that about 90% of them are in need of urgent aid as they have been profoundly impacted by violence, displacement, severance of family ties, and lack of access to vital services such as education and health care. All of these emergencies, further aggravated by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, paint a grim picture. Pope Francis himself has continually appealed for peace in the war-ravaged country. During the Angelus on Sunday, he once again lamented the Syrian war because it has caused one of the worst humanitarian disasters of our times. He called on the international community to provide decisive and renewed commitment to rebuilding the country and urged the faithful to pray to the Lord so that the great suffering in Syria may not be forgotten. As the country struggles with its challenges to restore peace after 10 years of hostilities, Vatican News spoke with Maronite Archbishop Joseph Topji of Aleppo, who reflects on the situation of war in Syria and its devastating effect on the country's citizens. Archbishop Topji expressed gratitude to Pope Francis for his appeal for an end to war in Syria and noted that hearing the Holy Father's appeal was a great relief as the people in Syria feel forgotten. The Archbishop added that sanctions have thrown the country into further despair and an estimated 83% of the population is living below the poverty line. Amid the prolonged years of fighting, the church has also been profoundly affected. The Archbishop explained that currently, Christians are less than a quarter of the number they used to be before the conflicts began. On top of that, young people and professionals are fleeing the country while the poorest and the vulnerable remain. However, in spite of everything, Archbishop Topji expresses optimism that the church will do its best to be active. He notes that some churches are being renovated and plans are being made to renovate even others more. This is a sign that despite many difficulties, we are still here, he said. I'm Father Benedict Mayaki. Archaeologists in Israel have unearthed fragments of a 1,900-year-old biblical scroll which contains pieces of the Old Testament. As Devin Watkins reports, experts are calling it the most important archaeological discovery in the last 60 years. The Israel Antiquities Authority has unveiled a discovery of biblical proportions in several desert caves. In a dig that began in 2017, archaeologists discovered around 80 new parchment fragments of Old Testament texts. They contain verses from the books of Zechariah and Nahum, which are part of the book of the Twelve Minor Prophets. The fragments form part of a scroll which experts believe belong to Jewish rebels who hid in the caves after a failed revolt against Roman rule in the 2nd century AD. Israeli archaeologists also unearthed a cache of rare coins from the same period, a 6,000-year-old skeleton of a child, and a large woven basket dating from around 10,500 years ago, the oldest intact in the world. Marcello Fidancio, the director of the Archaeological and Cultural Institute of Biblical Lands in Lugano, described the find to Vatican News as a new page in the history of archaeological excavations. He said it is the first discovery of note since the great excavations of the 1940s and 50s which brought the Dead Sea Scrolls to light. Discoveries of such significance, he pointed out, rekindled the excitement of pioneers. The fragments contain very small amounts of text from the Old Testament, but they still have something to offer scholars. Professor Fidancio noted that they provide evidence of textual fluidity, which was when the biblical text was not yet stable or fixed. He said the scroll can help scholars understand a stage which led to the definitive text. The fragments are written primarily in Greek, with only the name of God written in ancient Hebrew. Professor Fidancio said it showed great respect for the unutterable name of God. Writing it in another alphabet, he concluded, is a scribal strategy that seeks to focus the reader's attention and respect on those letters that form God's name. I'm Devin Watkins. Celebrations are well underway in Ireland this March 17th for the Feast of St. Patrick. However, for the second year running, the traditional parades and parties have had to be cancelled or postponed due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. Instead, the country and the Irish diaspora around the world are marking the national holiday virtually with a series of online events. Lydia O'Kane spoke to the Irish ambassador to the Holy See, Derek Hannon, about the celebrations amid current restrictions. I was looking at a a headline in an article there. The headline was in big and bold and it said, Official, St. Patrick's Day in Ireland is cancelled. Now, it was referring to, obviously, the physicality of the parade and everything else. But it does get you thinking, though, that it kind of would be impossible to cancel St. Patrick's Day and and the national holiday, wouldn't it? Oh, I think so, yes. And, of course, as you know, St. Patrick's Day is a global event now. I mean, I often think sometimes when I've been posted abroad in places like the States, sometimes I felt like a big player in a big, as in B-I-T, not big, big player in our own uh, national day. 
but I, I say that slightly tongue in cheek because I think it's uh, it's fantastic that we've managed to export. I don't think any other country has a national day that's really celebrated as a as a global holiday as as St Patrick's Day is. So even even if we were to be able to to cancel St Patrick's Day in Ireland, which of course is ridiculous, and we never would, it would still continue around the world. That was Irish Ambassador to the Holy See, Derek Hannon, on St. Patrick's Day celebrations amid current restrictions, speaking there to Lydia O'Kane. Advancing Integral Disarmament in Times of Pandemic is the title of a series of online events that aim to reflect on the need to stop weapons production and proliferation in support of Pope Francis's and the United Nations call for a global ceasefire. The initiative is organized by the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development and the Vatican COVID-19 Commission in collaboration with the Strategic Concept for the Removal of Arms and Proliferation and the SOAS University of London. The first in the series of three online events will take place on the 23rd of March. The webinars foresee the participation of religious representatives and researchers who will reflect on the efforts to promote a global ceasefire by stopping weapons production and proliferation. As explained in a statement released by organisers, the initiative aims to offer the international community and religious leaders concrete options to follow the path of integral disarmament in response to the encyclical Fratelli Tutti. And finally, returning to the general audience today, Pope Francis continued his reflections on prayer as a relationship with the Holy Trinity, part of his ongoing catechesis on prayer in general. Christopher Wells tells us more. At Wednesday's general audience, the Holy Father focused in particular on the role of the Holy Spirit. The first gift of every Christian existence is the Holy Spirit, said Pope Francis. The Holy Spirit opens our hearts to Christ and allows us to invoke God as Abba, that is, Father. The work of the Holy Spirit, the Pope continued, is to remind us of Jesus, to make him present in the lives of Christians of every time and place. Because of the Spirit, Jesus is not distant but with us always. He still educates his disciples by transforming their hearts. This, said Pope Francis, is the experience of so many who pray, men and women whom the Holy Spirit has formed according to the measure of Christ, in mercy, service, prayer. Seeking God, the Pope said, they safeguard his presence, in the Gospel, in the Eucharist, and in the faces of those in need, like a secret flame. Il primo compito dei cristiani è proprio mantenere vivo questo fuoco che Gesù ha portato sulla terra. Pope Francis said that keeping this flame of God's presence alive is the first task of Christians, a task symbolized by the lighted lamps that burn night and day before the Eucharistic presence in the tabernacles of Catholic churches. Finally, Pope Francis said the Holy Spirit is the interior master of Christian prayer. E il maestro interiore della preghiera cristiana. In the endless field of holiness, Pope Francis said, in conclusion, the one God, the Trinity of love, allows the variety of witnesses to flourish, all equal in dignity, but also unique in the beauty that the Spirit has willed to be expressed in each of those whom God's mercy has made his children. I'm Christopher Wells. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Vatican and World News. For more on these and other stories and to hear this broadcast as a podcast, please be sure to visit our web portal at www.vaticannews.va. You can also catch the latest updates on our Facebook page or on Twitter. Many thanks go to Joe Mauriello in studio. In the Vatican, I'm Francesca Merlo. <laughs>